All right, let's dive into a classic economics question that looks super simple on the surface, but, you know, it trips up so many students. But don't worry, by the end of this explainer, you're going to see the subtle but crucial difference that's the secret to absolutely nailing the answer. So, let's get right to it. Okay, so here's our game plan. We'll start with the question itself, break down the real versus nominal worlds with a neat analogy, get our definition straight, and then I'll walk you through how to write the perfect answer, how an examiner actually grades it, and we'll even look at what comes next. First up, let's tackle the challenge head on. Here's the core question we're deconstructing today. So here it is. What is classical dichotomy? Is it the same as neutrality of money? Explain. Now you can see it's really a two-part question, a definition and then a comparison. And while it seems pretty straightforward, it's that second part, that relationship between the two terms, that's the subtle trap where so many people lose easy marks. Okay, before we get bogged down in all the formal textbook definitions, I want to use a really simple analogy. This should help everything just click into place and give you a solid gut feeling for what's going on. So picture this. Imagine the entire economy is a big workshop right? The stuff it can actually produce, like chairs, tables, you name it. Well, that depends on real things, doesn't it? It depends on your workers, your tools, your technology. That's the real side of the economy. Now think of money as just a measuring tape. It's the tool we use to put a price tag, a nominal value, on all the things in that workshop. So you've got the real workshop and the nominal measuring tape. And here is the absolute key to understanding this entire concept. Think about it. If you swap your measuring tape from one that uses inches to one that uses centimeters, did the actual physical size of the chair change? No way, of course not. All you did was change the number you used to describe its size, and that's exactly what classical economists were getting at. They argued that money works the same way. All right, so now that we've got that workshop analogy firmly in our minds, let's connect it back to those official economic terms from the exam question. This is where it all comes together. So what is the classical dichotomy? Well, it's basically just the formal name for the idea of that separation we just talked about. It's the theory that says, hey, the real world of production, our workshop, and the nominal world of money, our measuring tape, are two fundamentally separate things. Real variables, like how many chairs you make, are driven by real factors. And nominal variables, like the price of those chairs, are driven by money stuff, like how much currency is floating around. Okay, so then what's the deal with neutrality of money? This is the result, it's the conclusion, that logically follows from the classical dichotomy. Think about it. If you believe that the real and nominal sides are separate, then it just makes sense that changing the money supply, you know, messing with the numbers on our measuring tape, is not going to change real output. It won't magically create more chairs. In that sense, money is neutral when it comes to the real economy. So let's be super clear, because this is the heart of the answer. Are they the same thing? Absolutely not. It's cause and effect. Dichotomy is the theory, the big idea of separation. Neutrality is the result, the direct consequence of that idea. Getting this distinction crystal clear is without a doubt the key to a high scoring answer. Okay, that's the theory down. But how do we take all this knowledge and actually craft an answer that's gonna get you top marks? Let's get practical and break down the exact structure that examiners love to see. The secret to a fantastic answer is always precision. Just look at the language here. We're not just defining the terms, we're defining the relationship between them. Using power phrases like theoretical framework for the dichotomy and resulting conclusion for neutrality, well, that shows a much deeper level of understanding. That's the stuff that really impresses a grader. So here you go, here is your four-step guide, your recipe for the perfect answer. Step one, start by defining the dichotomy. Step two, then define neutrality and make sure you explain it as a consequence of the dichotomy. Step three, and this is super important, you have to explicitly say, no, they are not the same and then explain why. And finally, step four, for those bonus points that push you to the top, add that crucial bit of context. This all holds in the classical long run view. Right, let's pull back the curtain a bit. What exactly separates a decent answer from an excellent one? To figure that out, let's try to think like a grader and look at how they'd actually score this. Okay, check this out. If you just define the two terms, you're probably landing in the average zone, maybe four or five points. You get into the good range, say six or seven, when you correctly define them, but also try to explain the distinction, even if it's a little fuzzy. But what gets you into that excellent eight to 10 territory? It's nailing that distinction and adding that final crucial detail, the long run context. That tiny addition signals that you've really mastered the concept. All right, 
We've pretty much nailed this question. So let's zoom out for a second and see how these ideas connect to the bigger picture and where you can go from here to learn more. For anyone using Mankiw's Principles of Economics, and I know a lot of you are, you'll want to head straight to chapters 30 and 33. In fact, when you get to chapter 33 and see that famous vertical long-run aggregate supply curve, that graph is a perfect visual representation of monetary neutrality. It's literally showing you that in the long run, output is determined by real factors and the price level can't touch it. And if you really want to level up your understanding, there are a few places to go next. First, check out the quantity theory of money, that classic MV equals PY equation. Then there's Say's law. But honestly, the most important thing to look at next is the Keynesian critique. This is the big counter argument. Keynes basically said, hold on, in the real world, things like wages are sticky. They don't change overnight. And because of that, changes in the money supply can and do affect real things like jobs and output, at least in the short run. Which brings us to a final big picture question to chew on. The classical dichotomy is you have to admit a really neat and elegant theory, but in the world we actually live in, a world of constant central bank action, crazy global financial markets, can we really say that money is ever truly neutral, even in the long run? That's a question economists are still fiercely debating right now, and it's something to think about.